huh? Oh, I'll get them. My bad. I, I'm mixed up here. Uh, I ain't got a drummer. Anybody else in here drum? Okay, drummers, we got guests in the house. Rhea, my bad, my bad. I, I got ahead of it. Deborah Turner, where's Deborah at from Beach City? Wave at me, Deborah. Deborah, thanks for coming to our early service this morning. Amen. Tommy, Tommy's from South Carolina. Tommy, right on the back row. Lift your hand if you would, Tommy. We got some homemade bread. Thanks for coming, guys. Anyone else first time here? My bad. I haven't done that in 15 years. <laughs> Always like the drum roll. Anyone else first time here? Yeah, anyone came in late? <laughs> you don't get bread for late. We're not going to reward that. Amen. We're just glad to have all of you here. We mean that. Got your Bibles? Mm-hmm. Amen. Got your Bibles. Luke chapter 24. I have an opportunity to give a, 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 a revised version of this message. Don't have time to get it all in. We've been talking about the uh, seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. Of course, two weeks ago, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The last statement of Christ on the cross, which was the prayer of uh, Hebrew children before they went to bed at night, before Jesus went to sleep, before he died. He, he allowed himself to use those, that prayer childhood prayer that he had prayed many of us have learned prayers our kids are learning prayers are learning scriptures you, you've got to hang on to that last week we talked about the power of the resurrection without the resurrection our faith is void without the resurrection we're, we're stupid today well i mean i, I say that and much uh wayne we'd be dumb being in church if there was no resurrection that's why I don't understand uh, synagogues or other places of worship. You, you know, if you've got a God worth, worth serving, he's a God that got up from the grave. Can I get an amen? And nailed him to the cross and laid him in the ground, but it should have known you can't keep a good man down. He got up, amen, resurrected for our sake. And because of that resurrection, we stand with tremendous confidence that we too will resurrect whenever we do. When I go to cemeteries, I remind myself they're only temporary. They're only temporary. Eventually, we will all resurrect from, you know, yeah, we used to use the phrase all the time, I'll see you later here, there, in the air. <laughs> Amen, which is true. You know, if, we get, if God catches the church away, he's going to snatch us up right where we're at. If, if we're in the grave, we, he'll snatch here or there or in the air. Amen. How many uh, realize you're getting older? <laughs> Do you feel that? I mean, uh, for, uh, and Lori reminds me, we, we bring the grandkids in uh, Colton is now eight years old. Now, he's been coming here being with me in the summer since he was two. And uh, so every summer, they come down from Colorado to hang out with Lolly and Paw Paw and you guys. And I'm watching as they get, she said, now, you want them for two weeks. <laughs> you want them grandkids for two weeks. But in just a few days from now, I'm going to hear you going, oh, man. Because you can't keep up with them. They're constantly wanting something. They want you to do something. Let's go swimming. It's, I mean, as soon as we got to the camp, he looked up at me with the greatest admiration. He said, I'm so glad you're my papa. And I smiled. I said, he said, because you got a camp. <laughs> I thought if we didn't have a camp, but you still like me as your papa. Hey, man, well, you know, you got to go swimming. You got to get ice cream. You got to go fishing. He says, just, just go shoot turtles, papa. Let's go shoot turtles. I mean, he's got all these things in his head. And I'm, I'm getting older, man. I can feel it. But I have matured. There's a difference in getting old and maturing. Amen. Amen. Some folk get old and they never mature. Amen. They never figure it out. I've learned that you cannot make someone love you. All you can do is stalk them and hope they panic and give in. <laughs> David said that's what he did. He'd been married five years yesterday. So amen. <laughs> I've learned that one good turn gets most of the blankets. I've learned that whatever hits the fan will not evenly be distributed. <laughs> I've learned that you shouldn't compare yourself to others. They're more messed up than you think they are. <laughs> I've learned that depression is merely anger with enthusiasm. <laughs> I've learned that you can keep vomiting long after you thought you were finished. <laughs> I've learned to not sweat the petty things and not pet the sweaty things. I've learned age is a very high price to pay for maturity. I've learned that I don't suffer from being crazy. 
I enjoy it. I've learned that we are responsible for what we do unless you're a celebrity. I've learned that artificial intelligence is no match for natural stupidity. <laughs> I've learned that 99% of the time when something isn't working in your house, one of your kids did it. <laughs> Even if they're gone and they come back and visit, they did it while they were visiting. I've learned that the people you care most about in life are taken from you too soon. And all the less important ones just seem to never go away. And the real pains, they're permanent. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to rub this knee with blue MU, two goats, bio freeze. It's here to stay. It ain't going. Are you comfortable? Let's get in the Word of God. Everybody got, got going to get older, but not everybody going to mature. God has so much for you and I to do. In the time that we have left. It is one of my prayers. I pray all the time. God give us a, a purpose of life and length of days. You know, I just want to link to my, my days. I just wanted to make sure that I get done in that day what needs to get done. And he's got so much going on. And, you know, I can't. No one really can spare your tears, your fears, your traumas. Each passion has its own cross of validation. Some of you have passion toward a disease that you know a family was connected with, or you yourself, and you're passionate toward that. Some of you, you know that uh, I, I'm passionate toward children. I have three adopted children, you know, uh, uh, and so it's it just, there's something about because of that, you know, I was arrested several times. There, there's an, a passion that you have toward things, but each passion you have toward something comes with it. And believe me, not everybody's going to jump on and carry your cross with you. Amen. They're not going to do it. They don't have to do it. It's your cross to bear. People call me all the time. Pastor, I want, I want us to do this. I want us to do that. I got this issue and I got that. It, it, it's not my cross to bear. That's God giving you the ability to step up. Amen. And I want to tell you, until you become a grandparent, you don't know what that cross is to bear. You'll start praying for your kids in a different light. So all these things start, start coming into to focus. And it will be what we endure that will express how deeply we desire. The disciples are scattered. They're in a messed up place right now. As a matter of fact, the word has come to them that Mary has seen Jesus. He's resurrected. And the scripture says he went and he met with them. And so we, we find that the, uh, but some of the disciples are, are instead of gathering, they have scattered. And, and I found that why, why is it, why do we drift toward weariness, chronic spiritual fatigue, being distant, evasive? Why does our life in Christ so often gather moss rather than bear fruit? You got to ask yourself why others seem to not get stuck or, or how they're able to break free if they do. And why do their lives in Christ grow richer and deeper and more fruitful? And we, we seem to almost envy those folk when we're going through things. And like the disciples, we need biblical education that leads to revelation. When I say revelation, that means you finally got it. I, I've met people their whole lives that have gone to church and didn't get it. They just didn't catch what the church was about. They didn't catch what Jesus did. They didn't catch what salvation was about. They didn't understand the Spirit of God. But when you catch that revelation, when you get enough education in your life, and then you get revelation, the light bulb comes on, then you should be inspired. There should be inspiration to live in the manifestation of what we call a holy wild life. Amen. That life has risk to it. Life has a way to uh, press into it. And, and if you can't just sit back, you've you got to move into it. Now, Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Now, the same day, two of them, disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. When I see them talking to each other, I realize they didn't have cell phones. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. They didn't, they didn't, this is what fascinates me. We, we want to be recognized. We want to, the, the acclaim. We want the poster. We want to be on TV. Jesus was anonymous. He comes out of the tomb as a gardener, and they didn't recognize him until he spoke. He's walking along with two disciples. They still don't recognize who he is. And verse 17, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still. Their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? 
Do, not, do you not know the things which have happened there in these days? Jesus said, what things? How many realize that, that question was to see what they know? So what they, they said, what about Jesus of Nazareth? They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, addendum to this, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning. They didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. The word's actually stubborn. How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, that's the Pentateuch, the beginning. All the prophets, he explained to them what, he had, been, what had been said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening the day is almost over so he went in to stay with them and when he sat down at the table with them he took bread gave thanks broke it and began to give it to them then everybody say then, then. okay hold on he starts in genesis exodus leviticus Deuteronomy. He's gone through all the scriptures. He hit the Psalms and the Proverbs. He hit uh, Matthew and Mark. Uh, he didn't get Matthew. I think he just went up to, to, up to uh, Malachi. Okay. Well, you know, why is that, Pastor? Come on. Think with me. Think with me. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John hadn't been written yet. Paul ain't saved yet. Peter ain't doing right yet. All right. So none of that's there. But he takes it all the way up to Malachi. Amen. Malachi, the Italian prophet. Amen. He runs it all the way up to there. And then he looks over at him, and they still didn't catch it. This is why I'm saying revelation is so important. Catching something is so important. Sometimes you can explain it to them, but until you take their head, reach through the bars and grab their head and run it like a, a cheese grater, they never catch it. Some of you still ain't going to get that one. <laughs> then he at the table, took bread, gave thanks, broke it. Gave to him. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Father, what we're asking for at the crossroads of life today is hearts that start burning. God, a desire to pursue you, to, to not just find you in the book, but, but eat with you and have relationship with you. Because it's in relationship that the book will be open to us. In Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. You can go to school. You can get to college. You can get hold them books. You can study it on the internet. But until you have relationship with the living Christ, you ain't going to understand this book. Amen. You got to have rela- You got to walk with him. There's an old song. I want to walk. I want to walk and talk with Jesus each and every day. I want my life to be an example of him in every way I want to do. Unto others, what he, you don't know my mind, man. My mind will run into stuff. It ain't written down. It just kind of gets to flowing. Amen. But there's something about it. And as we've learned, it's been a stressful week. The one they had pinned their hopes on and dreams on Christ Jesus had been falsely arrested, accused, beaten, unbelievably crucified. They rode the stone uh, uh, over the grave and they thought it was over. And then they heard he had risen. How much more could they take? Discouraged. They were confused. And they're walking away. They're seven miles away from Jerusalem. I don't know if you've walked seven miles lately, but that's a, that's a few trips around your local mall. I mean, it's a long way. The tomb is empty. Christ has now risen. Two of the disciples are heading home. They've interrupted on the crossroad. Amen. By Christ, the scripture says they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. You know, and they could have been talking about anything. They could have been talking about fishing. They could have been talking about their job. They could have been talking about their wives or their kids. But when Christ came next to them, they were talking about the thing that mattered the most, the resurrection of Christ. Amen. The thing that, that, that would affect their life. And Jesus came up and he walked along with them. You got to walk with it. 
You got to walk. It ain't just Sunday. You got to walk with him. You got, you got to walk with him whenever you're going to work. You got to walk with him when you're heading shopping. You just got to walk with him and, and, and let him share with you. The scripture says they were slow. They, they, their hearts were slow. And then it was burning. Verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us. Your Genesis, Jesus started with Genesis. And he works his way through. You may have heard me say this just a couple of times. But your Genesis will will determine your revelation. How you start is how you're going to finish. You know, starting church off on Sunday is a great way to get your week rolling. How you start, so he starts from Genesis. He starts moving them. And they were slow of heart to believe. Slow, dull, beginning to callous. The hardest thing, the worst thing for any believer is this. Gospel hardened. When you've heard too much and you've done too little. If you don't activate your faith, if you don't do something with what you got, you start getting a little bit calloused. Now, I am a, I'm a person that, uh, because of the, the, the muscular dystrophy and the surgeries I've had on my feet, they callous up quickly. When they callous up, they get real hard. And if I don't do something with it, they'll get sores. And next thing you know, I can barely walk. And that's the way our hearts get. They callous up. And if you don't do something with it, if you don't break up the fallow ground, as the Old Testament said, if you don't say, do something to get excited again. That's why when I, we take communion, I'm thinking to myself, there were some folk in here that God blessed this morning. Amen. They got revelation and understanding. I got to let folk go. I got to pray. I get forgiven. I got to release some things in my life. And I believe things are going to turn out for the better. The, his manners, it wasn't the, the preaching. It was his manners. Manners open doors. Just let me say that. Since my grandkids have been with me, I've been trying to teach them the same thing I've been teaching my kids for all these years. Up to them to catch it. But yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Opening the door for a lady, amen, pardoning other people, take, picking up their plate, being kind toward others will open doors for you that your resume will not. Amen. amen. Learning how to, and when Jesus sat down, he began to pray. If he prayed over the bread, well, well, he wasn't praying. He was giving God thanks for it. That's what our prayer is about. We thank God for provision. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, used to, I thought when you prayed over something, you just prayed it wouldn't make you sick. That's not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm giving God thanks for the provision for that meal. Unlike a brother-in-law I once had, that every time he went grocery shopping, he put all his groceries on the table and gave God thanks one time for it. And he said, that ought to take care of it. I said, that, that's cheating right there. That's cheating. You can't do it that way. You're going to have to give God thanks every meal like Jesus did. He didn't lay in all the fish. Okay, never mind. He acted as if he were going further. That's something Jesus would often do. He did that when he was walking on the water. But they urged him strongly to stay. After he broke the bread, their eyes were open. Imagine, imagine their astonishment. They heard him preach from Genesis all the way to Malachi. And, and even at that moment, they didn't catch it. But as soon as they realized who he was, they got excited. And at that moment, they said, you're j-. And before they could get Zeus out, Jesus was gone. That fast. In a blink, he disappears. You know, I, and, and he looked at one, looks at the other, and said, Man, my, my heart is starting to get a little bit warm. I feel a little bit of heat in here. So they went from dull to a dangerous heart. And this is where Satan hates it, man. When your heart is dull, and you, I don't think he cares as much about you being saved as you think he does. I'm talking about the devil right now. As long as you just stay saved. And stay in your own lazy boy and stay home and don't be salt and don't be light and don't connect with people and don't aggravate folk and offend uh, because of, 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 of your love for Jesus, which often happens. I'm not asking you to go criticize anybody. Uh, again, I will repeat to you that, that anytime somebody uses criticism that's not been asked for, excuse me, unsolicited advice always leads to criticism. When, you, when it's not solicited, in other words, I didn't ask your opinion. Everybody say, look at your name, say, I didn't ask your opinion. Oh, some of you are afraid right then. Some of y'all fear running all over you. Amen. I, it, but when I didn't ask for it and you give it to me, then it, it sounds like criticism to me. But if I ask for it, then I'm needing it. I feel like you're educated enough to share with me and help me out in this moment. So he, here, the disciples, you cannot comprehend the Scripture until you follow the Savior. Until you know him, until you have personal relationship, and it's not, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. It's, it's like making a friend. It's sticking your hand out. It's wanting to hang out. 
It's wanting to talk to. It's wanting to connect with. That, that's, it. that's how it is. Relationships will open our eyes. Let me help you. Relationship with people. Some of you have been wanting to have a relationship with certain folk and connect with them. And as soon as you get to know them, it opened your eyes. Come on. Oh, I wish I was his friend. Oh, I wish I was her friend. And as soon as you had relationship, your eyes were open. And you said to yourself, dear Lord Jesus. You have rescued me again. Amen. I have figured this thing out. Open minds can open hearts. Luke 24 says, and he said to them, come on up, Josiah. I'm going to just use you a little, back, little background here. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. Can you see the lights going on? Now, maybe they didn't recognize uh, until the communion, the breaking of bread, the fellowship, that that's who he really was. But something was stirring their mind while he was talking to them. He even uses the term me. Why didn't I see that before? From slow heart to burning heart. He's everything in the book. You know, when you get in this book, everything begins to change. When he hit Genesis, I don't know, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love to have been there? Wouldn't you love to have heard what he said about himself? I bet that there were uh, things that we've never seen before. I mean, I, I mean, my mind and my imagination, I can go, in Genesis, I'm the, I'm the seed. I'm the seed that will crush Satan's head when he talked about that. In Exodus, I was the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, I'm the atoning sacrifice. In Numbers, I'm the bronze serpent when they were bit and, and, and rebelled against Moses and they put me on a stick and they lifted me up and they said, look and live. Amen. In Deuteronomy, I'm the promised prophet. In Joshua, I was the warrior standing there against Josh, and I said, I'm here to take over. In Judges, I'm the deliverer. In Ruth, I'm the kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, Kings, and the Chronicles, I was the promised king. In Ezra and Nehemiah, I'm the restorer of the nation. In Esther, I'm the advocate. In Job, he's our redeemer. In Psalms, he's our all in all. In Proverbs, I'm the pattern and wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he was our goal. In Solomon, he was our beloved. All the minor prophets, he's the coming prince of peace. Then he hit the New Testament. Well, you wonder, what, what did they say about him? What did they say about him? Matthew, he was the king. Mark said he was a servant. Luke said he was the son of man. John said he was the son of God. Amen. He was in the very beginning. The book of Acts tells us he was Christ ascended, seated, and sending. All the epistle letters... He was Christ indwelling and filling. The book of Revelation, he's Christ returning and reigning. He's all those things. When you read your Bible, it's like throwing kindling in the fire. And the Holy Ghost blows on it, and the fire starts back up again. Did not our hearts, I was telling my pastor this morning when I was preaching, he said, you're in trouble. I said, I know. There's too much in this. It's too much. There, there's the study of humanity here. How that when things don't go our way. We walk away. When our dreams are shattered. I can't do it alone. I got to have somebody walk with me. Are you mad because it went down that way? Are you mad because Jesus didn't come and deliver all Israel? Are you mad because we thought he was and he didn't? Yeah, okay, good. Walk with me because I'm offended too. It's a study of human nature. And then Christ, jealous and nosy, won't leave you alone. Right in the middle of your day shift, he shows up. Right in the middle of what you're talking about. He throws his nose in there and says, what you talking about? But listen, I promise you, there are times in your life you pray to God, He don't show up and ask you at that moment what you're talking about. He called them on a good day. Can I get an amen? amen. What y'all talking about? And he said, We're talking about Christ. They crucified Him. And the women said He resurrected. Word came from the other disciples that they saw that He wasn't there either. Hey, you know, since He's all that. Why, why are we sitting out here? Why is all that? Why is our heart dull and slow? You know, we are like these two disciples. We are so much like them. Does not our hearts burn within, within us? Jesus can walk the road with us. 
he can look straight at us and many of us still not recognize him. But when he opens the word to us, our hearts go from slow to burning. What did you come here for this morning? I want my heart on fire again, Pastor. Uh, sorrow to hope in a future. From self-pity, all poor me, to all. From worry to wander. From doubt to belief. From tugging our way to going his way. From depart from me, I'm a sinful man. For to God, I'm going to forsake all and follow you. From we want you to do for us. You remember James and John's mama, let them sit on your right and left. We want you to put me in the highest place to, hey, can you drink this cup? Because if you can't drink this cup, you can't sit with me. If you can't carry this cross, you can't sit with me. From a murmur, slow heart, which makes the journey wearisome. When I talk with people about age and, and getting up, they tell me, I, was, I ran out of wind. Just ran out of wind. Just need a little more wind. And in life spiritually, we need a little more wind. We need a burning heart. It keeps us going on through the journey, inspires us. So, Pastor, why do we get stuck? Because we don't understand the scriptures. We don't understand that God has this thing set. He has life set for us. He has purpose set out for us. We get stuck and even think it's okay to stay stuck. Our understanding is how we see and don't see God. So we've invented, and this is what Bob, we invented this safe God. We invented a God that's still behind the curtain. We invented this, 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 uh, if we can get down the yellow brick road toward the Wizard of Oz, that kind of God. We've invented him. He's nice. He's pampering. He overlooks my or sin and he begins he begins to see God as safe and yes in one sense he is our refuge or oh, he's my fortress he's my shelter he's a shield about me he's comfort and he's peace but that's not what I mean we've become comfortable rather than comforting we've become peaceable docile rather than being a peacemaker instead of a hiding place we want to ace in the hole and if that don't work, we want to love him from a distance. A safe God to validate our slow hearts. We talked about this, David and I did, that there are times that Moses and Joshua, Moses went up on the mountain. He was with God in the thunder and the earthquake and, and Joshua hung out at the bottom. But the people stood far away. They had a primal view of God. They didn't understand him. You know, I have a reverent fear of him, but I have never in a storm thought to myself, all right, God, take your best shot. Because he loves me too much. He's not going to hit me. Amen. I don't have a primal fear. I know who he is. I've seen it in his son Christ. Amen. He loves me too much. But he's always bidding me to come. He's always asking me to risk. He's always saying you got to do. Step out a little bit more. God, I'm, honestly, I'm tired. <laughs> and he said, okay. <sighs> Take that. And if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quicken your mortal body quicken we talked about this last week amen if it quickens your body you're going to be able to fulfill the purpose of God in your life stand with me what good is life without living what good is food Without tasting. Somebody asked me the other day, you want some of that tofu? I said, what is that? They said, whatever you mix it with, it tastes like it. If I put tomato juice in there, it'll taste like a hunk of tomato. I preached on tofu a couple years ago, and I promised myself I'd never do it again. I have to back off on that one. I got myself in a little trouble. God is calling us from slow to burning to live in what we, we've called, and it's not just, it's our mantra, yeah, but, but it's a, a holy, wild lifestyle. It's, it's knowing He's holy, but God is wild. He creates us men in the wilderness. He, he bids us to come. He's always pulling. He's, when He looked at these two disciples, He didn't say to them anything else other than by. Then they made the decision, let's get back to Jerusalem. 
They made a decision. Let's go home. Let's turn this thing around. In other words, they're sitting there with him. And we got a record of it in the Word of God that they were sitting with him. And now he's gone. And they think to themselves, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? We got to go celebrate. We got to go tell folks. We just had John 13 again. We had, we had communion with him again. We had bread that he broke and he blessed the, the wine. I'm, I'm telling you, let's go back. And their hearts that were dull went back. What a testimony to have. You know, I can't spare, again, your tears, your fears, your traumas. Each passion has its own cross of validation. But many today are at the crossroad, slow of heart. And we know a little, but not enough. I've done funerals the last few weeks. My last one I did over at Rosewood. I preached basically, if you with me, a lot of the same message because they're always different people. I've preached all over the country and the world. And, and it's not being boastful. But God's given me this new mandate for funerals. And I, I do a lot. I got, again, like I said, another one this week. But in doing those funerals, something has clicked in my spirit that most folk that I stand before don't know sick them from come here about eternity, about death, about what's going to happen next, what the Bible teaches us about the resurrection. They don't know. And if you can share it in such a way without being condemning and mean, you're going to find the funeral director running you down in the parking lot saying, I have never heard anything like that in my life. I didn't say a person. I said a funeral director. And this has happened to me over and over where a funeral director, Tommy and Renee, y'all got here through a funeral. You heard me at a funeral. It, it, they, they, they come, and it's, and it's not that I'm all that, but I have understanding and revelation. And when people catch it, it's like, all right, I got something left in life to do. I need to do something. And if the funeral director can finally catch it, yeah. then we want the people to catch it. Amen. Slow heart to burning. But when we have a personal relationship with Jesus, our hearts begin to burn and we change direction. Almost 40 years now, walking and learning. Still ain't got it all down. Walking and learning. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Those watching through the internet, same question to you. If you don't have the security in your heart, that Christ is your Lord, and Savior, and King. Put your hand up right now. We want you to leave here with that. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Just slip your hand up. We'll pray for you where you stand. You need to be secure when you leave this place, knowing that you know. Anyone else before we pray? Amen. Thank you. Would we pray this together? And we're also praying for that heart to fire up. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I took communion. I'm saved. I love you. But my heart needs more fire. Breathe on it. Cause my life to come alive for you. I give you praise that today is my genesis. My life is turning around. My family is turning around. My sphere of influence is turning around. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God. Just, just kind of warm it up there.